Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Glick, and I want to welcome you to the School of Education's Orientation for New Students. Today, we, I congratulate the students who have been accepted into the BEAD Early Childhood Care Certificate Program and the degree program, which is the BEAD Primary General. At this point in time, I want to say congratulations to all on behalf of our Director of the School of Education, Professor Jerome Delisle who is unable to be with us physically, and he has sent his greetings via video, which I will share at this time. I encourage you to participate and pay attention to the valuable information that will be shared with you prior to your advising session this afternoon. We welcome you to the School of Education. Welcome students. I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person, but uh, videotape this so that you will have a chance to uh, see who I am and I will have a chance to welcome you. Welcome to the School of Education, Faculty of Humanities and Education. Of course you uh, are probably reg registered either in the Cert Ed or the BA Primary School program. And both programs train you to become uh, a teacher at some level, either at the primary school level or at the early childhood level. Now the programs you will experience in this uh, school are quite intensive, but they are enjoyable. And the months, though they seem long, will pass away quickly. The memories and the skills and the competencies that you gain will last forever. Now teacher preparation programs all over the world, they've changed tremendously. Uh, international high quality programs focus upon knowledge, skills and attitudes or values. Uh, so we, we, we can't think of a teacher only in terms of the knowledge they have or even the skills they have in lesson planning. They must have critical values. And we'll discuss some of these values because it's something that uh, as the School of Education evolves, it, 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 we, we want to continue instilling that in the people that we train. I want to tell you that the Monday teacher, uh, our focus is on creating the best teachers that we can, is a quite a unique professional and they will have a wide range of these uh, knowledge, skills uh, and, and, and values because they have to manage, and this is a new word for you, the teaching learning e ecosystem. And by saying that, it, it helps you to understand that teaching and learning is quite complex. The individuals that we teach are complex, but also the interaction between the different variables. That's complex too. So it's not just a, a transmitter of knowledge, you know. As, as kids, we say, let's play teacher, and we take a whip and we uh, hit persons. We don't hit these days. Um, but what we understand, it teaches more than that. They facilitate, they manage learning, and they become a catalyst for those who want to learn. I, I promise to discuss with you those values uh, that uh, many Monday programs try to instill, and uh, we will do that. Perhaps we don't do it um, in, in an intense way, but it is our intent. Care and concern for pupils. That's, that's critical. We, we need to, to really have empathy for the people that we teach respect for diversity and a sense of social justice. We want to see things change and we want to help those who need help. Believes that all students can learn, that's, that's critical. Um, maybe we've had uh, past beliefs that some people can't learn and only some people can. Well, if we're a teacher, we have to believe that all students can learn and we have to act towards that belief commitment and dedication to teaching, collaboration and team spirit. You could learn that as well as you engage in this program. It's not just about you, it's about working with the persons next to you. And a desire for excellence and innovation. We should have a picture of what excellence means in our mind and we work towards it. So we will teach you the philosophy, the psychology, the sociology and and that will help you to, to really build the skills that 
will avoid many of the pitfalls that we see today in terms of interpersonal and social interaction. We hope that you will benefit from our programs, you would develop these qualities, and uh, reach out and work with us. So I hope I see you around campus and we get a chance to speak. And I just want to encourage you, as even as Prof. Dilan mentioned, that we, this is a, we need empathy, and I ask you to empathize with us as teachers in, in preparation and to embrace the change that is ahead of us and know that we need to collaborate and work as teams. At this point, I would like to give you a little background on the School of Education before I introduce the other presentation. The School of Education has been in operation for approximately 35 years and is currently under the leadership of Professor Jerome Delay with approximately 40 full-time academic members of staff. And we have about 30 technical support staff who are working in the background to make sure that the delivery that you get in your online learning is efficient and accurate. And at this time, I'd want to introduce you to one of our lecturers, Dr. Paulson Scarrett, who will make a short presentation. Dr. Scarrett, over to you. It's a good opportunity to, to meet you. Um, I'm one of the first lecturers that you are going to be meeting, those of you in the BEAD uh, program, so that on Monday evening, uh, we get a chance to, to look at the role of reading. We spent a whole year, actually, um, training you to become teachers of reading. And why is that so important? That quote you're seeing on the screen that says, you need to know not only what to teach, how to teach it, but it's important to know why you need to teach it. And sometimes people ask me, when, you, when, when I say I'm a lecturer in reading education, they would say, well, what are you teaching? We have a crisis in reading in Toronto and Tobago. And so it's important for us to, to understand why we need to teach reading and why you need to become effective teachers of reading. So in for several years, we've participated in what is called PULS, an international uh, literacy assessment and PULS, as they look at all of the countries involved in the, ass in the assessment, they determine what makes good readers. And they, these are the range of things that they have, uh, they write early environment, they have um, highly qualified teachers of reading and reading instructions are priority in the schools that students attend, that they have those early resources, print rich environments, um, they have good attitudes toward reading so they see that their parents reading and they themselves uh, want to read. But when we look at the data from PULS, Trinidad and Tobago, there are two issues you're seeing in, in the diagrams here. One, the average performance internationally, our overall performance isn't even reaching the average performance. And do you notice from slide, the slide on the right side, one of the problems we have are boys and girls our boys are not performing as well as the girls when it comes to reading. And so just a few of our students are actually achieving at the high international benchmark. And at the advanced national be benchmark, 24% at the high international benchmark, 55% at the intermediate, and 80% of our students are only achieving at the low international benchmark. What are the problems? Now, the problems that the, the other countries that are on the high international benchmark that are doing well, it's not that they don't have the problems, but the teachers, the school systems, because the teachers are well trained, they've been able to compensate, to accommodate for those things. And so their students are able to achieve well. And that's why our goal is on training you. So when you come in and you get into the school system, you know what to do. You know why you need to teach reading in a systematic, explicit way. You know, what you need to teach systematically and explicitly, and you know how you need to do that. So to compensate for things like the lack of home resources, compensate for things like so many students not having high quality early literacy experiences before they come into school, to compensate for intergenerational illiteracy where you have mom can't read, papa can't read, maybe grandparents who can't read, and so they, they're not having those kinds of models or support systems in the home. And socioeconomic status. We have a lot of students who are living in extreme poverty, particularly those boys who are not able to read. 
Um, and, and so they're not having access to those resources. So that's one set of, of conditions or environments that's impacting our students and why you need to take this program so seriously to understand the skills, the power you need to teach, to understand what you need to teach. But we also have another problem. We have students whose brains are not wired to be able to read well. They have some neurological deficits. And so that's something they can never change. But what can change because of if, if you get the right kind of instruction, the brains of students with dyslexia, students whose brains are affected because of neurological issues, can be rewired. The brain's plasticity allows for it to change. And so with the right kind of instruction, we have evidence that shows that while initially, because our brain, the left side of our brain is what really is needed for, for reading. But if you look at the brains of a student with dyslexia, there's not much activation going on there. But if you benefit from the training, we will provide you. When you get into the classroom and you work with your students, you're going to be able to get them to have the right side of their brain rewired, have those neurons connecting properly. This is real, this is science. And we in Trinidad listen to the science, right? That's why we're doing so well with COVID-19, most of us. So that can happen. And so that means our goal is to make you effective teachers of reading. We'll spend the time doing that so you can offer instruction that is systematic. We're not making any assumptions. We're following a structured program that is explicit, that is motivating, balanced, strategic, skills based. And one of the things Pearl shows that our students are not, when it comes to comprehension, higher order reasoning, they're not doing that. So we're going to teach you how to do that how to manage classrooms, time and tasks, how to be wasting time, and how to work with our parents and, and, and to foster self-regulation. One more thing I want to draw your attention to. Our students, many of them coming to schools are growing up in homes where their parents speak Creole, the environment, the village speaking Creole. And our Creole is beautiful. I love it. I'm learning better and better every day to use it. But our Creole is, is has a one-to-one -one correspondence, very predictable when it comes to folding graphene, songs of letters, songs of the using speech, sorry, and the letters that they correspond to. English doesn't, English doesn't play fair. And I'd like to spread a short clip um, for you and, and, and listen to what the, um, this person is saying. Boys, years people been arguing about it. Since Rock of Ages was a pebble, people been knocking our creole tongue or dialect but our language is something rich and is something we should be proud of you see our colonial masters taught us that this language that you all speak this trini talk is backward is inferior it has no syntax it has no structure bad english bad grammar the lie that is to fool us you see, if you ask an English child in an English school to conjugate the verb to go, future tense, the English child will stand up, prim and proper, and say, I will go, you will go, he, she, or it will go, we will go. But if they taught our language in our schools and asked the Trinidadian child to conjugate the verb to go, future tense, the child will stand up and say, I go go, you go go, he, she, or it go go, all of we go go. So don't let nobody fool you. Our language has syntax and grammar too. You see, it's just that you have to understand the language. If you don't understand the language, you'll have problems. Trinidadians have a way of using the same word to mean a different thing in a different context. So a Trinidadian will never tell you, I beg your pardon, I didn't hear what you said. That's too long. We will shorten it and say, eh. <laughs> but when we want to emphasize that you don't like what we're saying and we say no, we could say, eh, eh, eh. Same, eh? 
different meaning, different context. And Trinidadians like to emphasize what they're saying. So a Trinidadian will never tell you that he reversed out of his garage. He will tell you that he reversed back. Why? Just to let you know that you can't reverse forward. And how many Trinidadians will tell you, you know, I was sitting down yesterday and I was thinking in my mind. I see them fighting. Yes, I see them with my own two eyes. Yes, I hear him bad talking here. I hear him with my own two ears. No, that is emphasis. You ever try to think with any other part of your body but your mind? You ever try to see anything with any other part of your body but your eyes? Emphasis. A Trinidadian will never say, Oh my gosh. I saw him only yesterday. To imagine he died so suddenly, I can't believe it. Not too long. <laughs> Is dead he dead? <laughs> Somebody lining up for the visa every morning, five o'clock outside the U.S. Embassy. And all of a sudden he gets it. And he just disappear. It's gone, he gone. <laughs> but mechanics are the best when it comes to emphasis. So my air condition was given trouble. Mechanics say, compressor bad. But don't worry, I have a brand new second-hand compressor for you. <laughs> because when we emphasize, sometimes we like to put words together. You see, we're so creative. We put words that are opposite in standard English together so that they make perfect sense to us. So, sweet and bad in standard English are opposites. But in Trinidad, we could look at a pretty lady and say, oh gosh, she's sweet too bad. And we would understand. And it's only in Trinidad that a Trinidadian could go into a shoe shop, try on about 20 shoes, and at the 21st shoe say, you see the shoe? Take it back. It's a little big. <laughs> little and big don't go together in standard English at all. Before the show at the bar, man buying the beer, he said, this beer cold like hell. I never knew hell was cold. And we like to pluralize. That's another part of us. So we wouldn't say, this shirt is mine, this shoe is mine, this pants is mine. We would say, mines. <laughs> and it's Coke, what mark on the label. But we don't say that. We say, Cokes. <laughs> pluralize. Add an S. Listen to the little children outside in the yard. Look at ants. <laughs> it's not bad English. It's culture. So, quite true. So very early in, our, in, in the course, we're going to be trying to work on ways in which we can get you to develop your linguistic skills. So linguistics is not offered in your program, but we're going to try to see some critical aspects of linguistics to help you to understand the linguistics of Creole and the linguistics of the English, the, the, the written English, standard written English, that our students need to read and write in. But very early, you'll also have in our course students from the ELE program who are doing several linguistics courses. And I'd like to encourage you to take advantage of working together with them. They'll be in the course with you to benefit from the understandings of linguistics they're bringing so that you can understand how Creole works in terms of the, the structure and be able to navigate your students to develop what is called metalinguistic awareness. I know how to say this in Creole, when I have to write it, this is what I have to do. I know how I say it in crew, but when I read it, this is what I'm going to see and help deal with the challenge that our students are having. I want to urge you, you cannot adopt, if you could, university students will get 10 classes, like just before exam, now for revision, we are bound to go, we can party, go by the beach. That end go up, 
If you want to become amazing teachers, you need to attend the classes. You need to be reading before class, getting your mind marinated with the information. So when you come to class and we talk, you'll be able to ask us the kinds of questions to interrogate the text that we're discussing, interrogate the content, the skills. Don't procrastinate. Don't, don't wait till last minute to try and get the work done because you are building skills. Skills take time. You need those, those skills to become part of you. So when you sit down to work with students, develop their phonological awareness, and, and you want to work on uh, phonemic awareness, those, those skills of deleting and manipulating phonemes, you, you can do that uh, fluidly. And you want to leverage your experiences. You, you know, some students who you have to work with in groups can be difficult. One of the most painful experiences of university student is having to deal with peers who don't who don't want to do the work and you doing it for yourself so if you want to, to deal with that very early leverage your experiences watch and see what the people really taking their work seriously those who have who make it they have proper internet um and write 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 you have to develop your writing skills there are many amazing students who have worked with and sometimes they fail courses it's not because they don't know the content it's not because they they won't be the best teachers in the classroom because they really know what to do, but they have trouble expressing themselves. And finally, if you're living in the bush, move. And I don't mean the literal bush. I mean, if you're having trouble with access to the internet because we're moving our classes, um, we've always, already been teaching online, we've always been doing that, but now we have to move fully um, remote teaching until we're able to see you face to face. So you need to make sure you have the necessary equipment, computer, the, the right internet bandwidth, um, and make sure your workspace is one uh, where you wouldn't have any inappropriate circumstances affecting your learning. And to conclude, I just want to do a read aloud for you. Uh, read alouds are very important and very soon when you come in, in September, it will be World Read Aloud Day shortly after you get to us. So we're going to be, every year we do an exercise promoting read alouds because it is one of the very important ways to promote reading when parents read aloud to their children every day, when teachers read aloud to their students every day. So I'm going to stop share and switch to uh, another document so you can see the read aloud while I, I do it really quickly. So this read aloud um, is the title, The True Story of the Three Little Pigs by Alexander Wolf, a stool by John Seitzka. So everybody knows the story of the three little pigs, or at least they think they do. But I'm gonna let you in on the secret. Nobody knows the real story because nobody has ever heard my side of the story. I'm the wolf, Alexander T. Wolf. You can call me Al. I don't know how this whole big bad wolf thing got started, but it's all wrong. Maybe it's because of our diet. Hey, it's not my fault. Wolves eat cute little animals like bunnies and sheep and pigs. That's just the way we are. If these burgers were cute, folks would probably think you were big and bad too. But like I was saying, the whole big bad wolf thing is all wrong. The real story is about a sneeze and a cup of sugar. This is the real story. Way back in Once Upon a Time, I was making a birthday cake for my dear old granny. I had a terrible sneezing cold. I ran out of sugar. So I walked down the street to ask my neighbor for a cup of sugar. Now this neighbor was a pig and he wasn't too bright either. He had built his whole house out of straw. Can you believe it? I mean, who in his right mind would build a house out of straw? So of course, the minute I knocked the door, it fell right in. I didn't just want to walk into someone else's house. So I called little pig, Little pig, are you in? No answer. I was just about to go home without the cup of sugar for my dear old granny's birthday cake. That's when my nose started to itch. 
I felt a sneeze coming on. Well, I hopped and I snapped. And I sneezed a great sneeze. And you know what? That whole darn straw house fell down. And right in the middle of the pile of straw was the first little pig, dead as a doornail. He'd been home the whole time. It seemed like a shame to leave a perfectly good ham dinner lying there in the store. So I ate it up. Think of it as a big cheeseburger just lying there. I was feeling a little better, but I still didn't have my cup of sugar. So I went to the next neighbor's house. This neighbor was the first little pig's brother. He was a little smarter, but not much. He had built his house of sticks. I rang the bell on the stick house. Nobody answered. I called, Mr. Pig, Mr. Pig, are you in? He yelled back, go away, wolf. You won't come in. I'm shaving the hairs of my chinny chin chin. That should be, you can't come in. I had just grabbed the doorknob when I felt another sneeze coming on. I, I huffed and I snuffed and I tried to cover my mouth, but I sneezed a great sneeze. And you're not going to believe it, but this guy's house fell down just like his brother's. When the dust cleared, there was the second little pig dead as a doornail, wolf's honor. Now, you know food will spoil. You just leave it out in the open. So I did the only thing there was to do. I had dinner again. Think of it as a second helping. I was getting awfully full, but my cold was feeling a little better. And I still didn't have that cup of sugar for my dear old granny's birthday cake. So I went to the next house. This guy was the first and second little pig's brother. He must have been the brains of a family. He had built his house of bricks. I knocked on the brick house. No answer. I called, Mr. Pig, Mr. Pig, are you in? And do you know what that rude little porker answered? Get out of here, wolf. Don't bother me again. Talk about impolite. He probably had a horse full of sugar and he wouldn't Give me even one little cup for my dear, sweet old granny's birthday cake. What a pig. I was just about to go home and maybe make a nice birthday card instead of a cake when I felt my cold coming on. I huffed and I snuffed and I sneezed once again. Then the third little pig yelled and your old granny could sit on a pin. Now, I'm usually a pretty calm fellow, but when somebody talks about my granny like that, I go a little crazy. When the cops drove up, of course, I was trying to break down this pig's door, and the whole time I was huffing and puffing and sneezing and making a real scene. The rest, as they say, is history. The news reporters, found out about the two pigs I had for dinner. They figured a guy going to borrow a cup of sugar didn't sound very exciting. So they jazzed up the story with all that puff and puff and blow your house down. And they made me the big bad wolf. That's it. The real story. I was free. But maybe you could uh, loan me a cup of sugar. So it was nice. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sure you, you can think of the wonderful things we could talk about with our students, make applications to what is happening with COVID-19 now. And we can show you, we, we're going to show you how you can make reading interesting, allow students to think on those higher level objectives and really learn to become the real kind of, of the citizens of a democracy that we need to address the problems of our country. So I'm looking forward to seeing you on September the 7th. We have class, very first day, full three hours from five to eight. And you back to the chair. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Scarlett. Reminded me of my story time days. My mother would read me stories, bedtime stories, the three little wolves that grow puff and puff and blew the house down. And we now know that there's another version to this story. 
at this point in time, this is a, I would like to introduce you to another aspect of our School of Education, and it's an area where we provide high quality evidence-based, low cost psychoeducational testing and intervention services to students, schools, so that we can help the disabled among us to better prepare to use the education system. And many times some people, as Dr. Scarrett mentioned, they lahe, they don't know how to start the assignment, they're doing things and they, they, they're not connecting the dots. And you, some people are, are, tend to be branded slow, differently abled, stupid sometimes, but it's just that they probably have a learning disability or a, a challenge, a challenge in learning or grasping certain concepts and they are not able to help themselves. And the Psychoeducational Diagnostic and Intervention Clinic managed by the SOE is one institute, such institute department, I should say, that provides such services so that you can better be able to help our students or even help ourselves. And at this point in time, I'm going to just play a short video to introduce you to these services. is an idea that started in 2013. We presented it to the departmental board in the School of Education. I think we got a good response, but people were a little hesitant in terms of sustainability and structuring. Fortunately, um, the current administration in UWI St. Augustine, led by the principal, and of course, in our case, we are led by the dean, um, of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. They understand what innovation is about. Now, it's not just about us. In fact, it was never about us. It's about the many students who do not have support for services, for special educational services, for psychoeducational assessment and intervention. We expect to find high incidence exceptionalities in the schools, but today we are seeing increasingly larger numbers of students presenting with autism and ADHD. Diversity issues related to factors such as gender, ethnicity, poverty also create special needs in our schools. When these factors and when these issues intersect with conditions of disability, complex cases are created. At this time, PEDIC is poised to respond. We are poised to assess, we are poised to intervene, and to find solutions to the issues that are prevalent in our schools today. From talking to teachers in, this, in the school system indicate that we have um, alarming levels of, of students, of children who cannot read and those who are struggling with reading. And this has to be addressed because reading is tied to everything. The problem is most of the children are going for a long period without being diagnosed, without having their issues identified. So PEDIC, our role uh, with regard to reading in PEDIC is to provide support to our, to our stakeholders like the Ministry of Education, providing support in terms of assessment, initial screening, especially for dyslexia, screening for other kinds of um, reading challenges, and then providing a systematic, intense, explicit intervention. The challenge is that um, people seem to have the assumption that reading is natural and easy, but it isn't. It's a complex linguistic achievement. And teachers need specialized training so that they're bringing evidence-based practice to the delivery of reading instruction. Come 
coming to us with a wide range of behavioral and learning challenges. These can include problems learning to read and write or problems doing math. Students also come in with problems communicating their ideas or following instructions. Some students have problems focusing in the classroom or even sitting still. Psychoeducational assessments use a variety of techniques and standardized instruments to help us determine what is underlying these problems. Is it medical? Is it neurological? Is it developmental? Is it environmental? Once we can understand what is underlying these problems, and even more, once we can identify how a child learns best, then we can recommend interventions that can be most effective at improving their functioning in these areas. That video is a short clip of the services that are offered by the Psycho Educational Diagnostic and Intervention Clinic, known as PEDIC, P-E-D-I-C, PEDIC. And some people may say PEDIC, but again, we see the need for using these services and using the reading skills that we we'll, we'll acquire as, a, as budding teachers and educators. At the School of Education, we, throughout, we have been preparing, preparing, we have been preparing teachers to educate at different levels. And we usually start at a certificate level, and then we move on to the early childhood care, and then we have the BF primary. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sabira abdul Majid, who is the coordinator of the Early Childhood Certificate in Education and the Early Childhood Care and Education degree. At this time, Dr. Sabira. Right, thank you very much, Nicole. All right, so good day, everyone. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm starting my screen and I'm the coordinator of the Certificate in Early Childhood Care and Development Program. And I just want to give you a little, a little um, overview of the program. And, and so this is the content slide that tells you what will be covered in this short presentation. So first of all, we're looking at for whom is the certificate program? Uh, what are the entry requirements, which you most probably know already if you are in the program, but just to make sure that you are where you're supposed to be in the course that you're supposed to be doing on the program. Who is who? The program itself, some things about the program, some general points to note, and some good advice. So here we go. So for whom? And the program is for secondary school graduates who want to become preschool teachers or um, people have used it to matriculate in, into the B.Ed. primary general program. Uh, teachers employed in early childhood centers who may be sometimes in private institutions and so on, and they want to upgrade their skills and their teaching credentials. They can do a certificate program and it's to develop knowledge, skills, competencies. Prof professor was speaking about that a short while ago. Okay, so your knowledge, spill, co skills, competencies, your values, your attitude to facilitate development and learning in young children, five years old. And in particular, these days, we sp speak about it in conjunction with their families. Okay, so what is the purpose again? The holistic development of reflective practitioners professionals. So you, you're here to be, if you are enrolled in the certificate program, you are, you are aiming to become a reflective uh, professional. Okay, and to the right there we have a male because we do have males in the program from time to time. It's, and um, not, uh, apart from the avenues from which I said people come into the program, that is like if you want to be a preschool teacher or so, we do have people sometimes coming from different uh, faculties on campus that might be related uh, to children like child psychology or something. And sometimes these students come to just do the year uh, um, certificate program because they want to work with children, they want to understand how children learn and develop and so on, okay? So when you leave as a professional, you would be sensitive to children's needs, 
and the needs of families, because remember I said it's in conjunction with families, you'd be caring, or you should be, uh, skilled in teaching young children, knowledgeable about current practices and ICT use, you know that, uh, you know, use of technology, particularly at this time of COVID and so on, it has highlighted how important it is to be, uh, you know, Ankura with what is the latest technology and what to use with children. So this course will expose you to that. And I would say in your class, you should pay particular attention to everything. But at this time, ICT use, make good use of your exposure to that when you do that particular class. So at the left here, I have the Bamboo Cathedral. I don't know if any of you all have been there. But you will see in some of the good advice to come later on that you should, you know, even though studying is, a, is technical, it's a lot of work, but you should um, get a chance to, to go outdoors sometime and just free your mind, okay? And there you see a pathway that can take you from darkness into light. You come in here not knowing too much about children and how they learn and develop, but if you pay attention to your class and you do your work, it can take you from this dark area and into the bright light and the road is endless it just goes on and on okay so the entry requirements five csec cxc including maths and Eng english now science is is an asset but it's not necessary for the program at this time and for, but however for some people who use it and then they want to move on to the bn uh, primary program, you need science to be a teacher in the primary school system, so just know that. And you need to have a police certificate of good character. That makes sense, right? You're working with small children. Okay, so this is a little bit of who's who in this, in, uh, at UWE here. And the first four bullets deal with, uh, uh, you know, the hierarchy. We have uh, the Dean. And uh, Dr. Heather Cato, we have Professor Jerome Delisle, who we met twice already in this presentation. Uh, we have the Administrative Officer, Mrs. Alicia Brooms Julian, and we have um, the Administrative Assistant, Student Matters, Miss Jennifer. Uh, you know, so these are. Sorry, let me go back here. Yeah, Miss Jennifer De Silva. So these are more at the faculty office at the higher hierarchy right up on top these are the people who you would have to go to if you have uh you know issues that would take you to that level then you have uh persons at the school of ed who you can interface with miss nicole blake who is our able moderator today with the face mask she's showing she's reminding you all the time that we are in COVID times and also miss marisha danu who let you in to the room earlier on and then at the FDCRC, that is the Children's Center, you have the manager, uh, which is me, and the coordinator of this BED program. You have the center supervisor, Ms. Diane Phillip, and you have uh, Mrs. Loretta Rampasad Leetang, who is the secretary there. Okay, so these are different levels at which you can make your queries, and it's good to know who to go to when you have what different kind of problem. Okay, the program is one year full time, but it's an evening program at five to eight, three semesters, 10 courses, including practicum teaching experiences. And the classroom location is at the School of Education, but the practicum site where you actually interact with children and so on is at the FDCRC Children's Center. The mode of delivery is blended online and face to face. However, as you know, we are in a period where we are taking directives from, you know, the chief medical officer and so considering how schools can practice safely at this time. So it might not be that we would have face-to-face -face interaction with children, but certainly you would listen and you would hear as we uh, adapt the program to accommodate these unprecedented, unprecedented times that we are faced in right now. Okay, so the degree is awarded based on obtaining 30 credits. So you come into this degree to pass all your courses, basically. You come in to study, you come in to learn, you come in to, you know, be enlightened, but you come to pass your courses, all right? There are three credit courses and you have three semesters. It's a one year program, three semesters. So know that for that year, you're gonna dedicate yourself to your studies. You are required to register at the start of each semester. You 
um, should be vigilant about checking your transcript online, making sure that you are registered and so on. That's your responsibility, okay? Uh, uh, assignment dates are to be treated as examination dates. So mostly you would have, most of the courses, there will be assignments that you have to write, take home assignment courses. You should do them and, and, and do them to the best of your ability and meet the deadlines, okay? Uh, a, a minimum, well, you try to do all your attendance, but a minimum of 75% attendance. Of course, if you have a particular extraneous circumstance, you should let, uh, you should let someone in authority know, okay? And your marks will be uploaded onto the system where marks are put for students to see where they are, what th their grades are. And these are the course offerings. You come in and you do foundations of early childhood. Well, this will be the first um, term. So this is what, first semester. So this is what you'll be doing. And that includes a practicum and you'll be told how that is modified for this uh, COVID period. Okay, growth and development of infants and toddlers, national standards and legislation for early childhood, management and budgeting. So these are the four courses that you would start with. Then you move on to semester two, where you would be doing community-based activities, attending to the special needs of young children, learning in a social context. And that is that in, within that course, you have the practical. And then you have technology and administration in early childhood education. And then the third semester, you're doing leadership and management of children's environment, engaging children through the project approach. And again, that's a, that includes a practicum. So let's talk a little bit about the practicum, which normally would be a, a required to attend two weeks of intense practical training at the UE Children's Center site, okay, which is on St. John's Road. And this is the dress code I'm telling you because we might start out without having face-to-face -face practicum and then along the way as we flatten the curve, uh, you know, you would, we would go back to normal or the new normal and then you may be required to come in. So this is what, if you have to come into the site, you wear, uh, you know, no fitted pants and jeans because within a child setting you have to bend, you have to stoop and so on. So you dress appropriately and you will have a mentor teacher and you would have coursework to submit. Apart from your practicum, you would have coursework to submit, a portfolio and so on, okay? So you will get these guidelines as we go along and you will get modified guidelines as we are guided by national directives on how to operate in a pandemic. General points, well, there's parking. Uh, when you come to the School of Education, which is where the classes, the face-to-face -face classes, will be held or some of the online classes will, this is where the teachers, your lecturers will be stationed. Uh, you know, there's a car park across the road. Make sure you have your car sticker and so on because there's, you know, clamping takes place around here. So you follow the rules in other words. Follow the rules, no problem. Your student ID needed to enter UE. Uh, you know, you have eaten on site. If you're at St. John's Road, you would soon find out where you can get something to eat if you didn't bring anything. Or at the School of Ed, there's a cafeteria here as well. Uh, washrooms, computer, you need computers, to, you need to have a computer, a good working computer, so invest in that, ask somebody to give you one as a gift if you are fortunate enough, you know, but you need a good working computer, laptop, to do your assignments, okay? Um, plagiarism, you, if you don't know the word, you should really um, research it and stay far away from that, you know what I mean? Make sure you understand it in all its dimensions and, and you know, don't plagiarize because you could be ex expelled from the university or suspended. And it's an embarrassing thing when we, you know, when we find persons and, you know, you have to go through that whole experience. So plagiarism, find out what it is. You know, that's when you take someone's work and, you know, and you, you put it and you splice it into your own work and you, you, you don't, do not give them credit for it. So there are ways of citing or quoting people and you, as, a, as an academic and as a professional that you are here to become, uh, you have to find out the right way to do it so that you don't plagiarize. Uh, grade point average, well, these are, you know, you would, these are, um, this is what you would, you would aim to have a good average uh, grade point and you have to meet your, your deadline, your, your assignment deadline. 
So some good advice. And you see, um, well, this little icon here is, you know, kind of showing you that you can work together with your classmates. You don't have to do it alone. It's not like uh, SEA where you're competing for a few spaces in the, the top schools. Here, everybody could get A's. Everybody could pass. Everybody could, you know, get the highest grades. So you don't have to be afraid to work with somebody. Of course, you don't steal people's work or, or so but you can work together and help somebody if they don't understand. So understand how the system works. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Use the facilities, attend all your classes and read, read, read. You know, so it said read for your degree and that is truly a read for saturation point. You know, let your family know that this is, you know, a one year sacrifice. If it is that you have family, and devote yourself to your studies and to achieve an excellence, okay? Get involved in an extracurricular activity if you, if you can, you know? Uh, learn a second language, well, you know, these things within your limits. These are just suggest suggestions. Be security conscious all the time. Get to know the country in spite of security concerns and enjoy learning. And these were some points that came from a previous um, vice principal of, of this university. All right, now I just added this about English language proficiency test, which is done three times a year. It may be needed for continuing into a degree program. So find out about signing up for it after you are through with your programs, uh, with your, yeah, with your program, okay? And that's it for me in terms of this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Majid. Thank you very much, Dr. Majid. And yeah. that presentation, very informative. And I trust that the students will be able to take some notes. And if possible, if you need be, it will be recorded and posted at the SOU webpage, where you will also find your student's handbook that you can browse through to see more of that information in detail. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Rewati Marad Sharma, the program coordinator for the BF Primary and ECCE degree programs at the School of Education. Dr. Sharma, over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Blake. And um, welcome, welcome, welcome to you students joining us this morning for the orientation. Now, I know many of you were present at the faculty's orientation last Tuesday. And at that session, Dean Heather Ketu welcomed you all as a historic cohort, a historic group of students. Indeed, we are today in August of 2020, living in a world that is very different from the world we welcome in January of 2020. And like all sectors all across the world, the education sector too has to respond to these new and uncertain times. So it cannot be business as usual. If anything, it is business unusual. So on that note, I really want to welcome you all to the School of Education, to our staff, some of whom you've met already, to the experiences, some of which you would have seen virtually already, the programs and the memories that we offer, even if it is being offered in a virtual setting. Now, Dr. Sabira Abdul-Majid just provided you with an overview of our certificate program. And what I will try to do now is to give you an overview of the BEAD Primary General Program. I will also share with you, so some of what I will say may overlap with what Dr. Majid said, but that's okay. It is just for emphasis, and it is so that you know, so that you're reminded of all of the things that you need to pay attention to. So I will try to also share some information, some important information like Dr. Majid did that will help you to smoothly navigate your stay and your experience with the School of Education and by extension, the University of the West Indies. So let me try to share my screen and um, we'll get going. <clears throat> so I'm sharing here. So could someone just indicate if it's if it's being seen? Yes. 
Yes, okay, good. Thank you very much. So once again, um, dear students, welcome. Welcome to the School of Education. I am Rewati Maraj Sharma, the BEd coordinator, as Ms. Blake indicated. So in today's orientation, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the Certificate in Early Childhood Care and Development, which Dr. Abdul Majid just did. And I will focus on the BEd Primary General Program. Now, we also offer here the BEd Early Childhood Care and Education Program, but we will not be admitting students for this academic year, the 2020-2021 academic year. But it is a program on our books and it is a program that we are known to offer. So let me see, I've gone, I've gone somewhere that I don't know. Um, right, so I'm back. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so Dr. Majid just spoke about the ECCD program, the certificate program, and she spoke about it being a one year um, program. So yes, it's a one year accelerated program. What um, the BEAD primary general program is, it's the degree program and it's a three-year program it's a 93 credit program and we have various entry routes into the beard primary general program so you can enter into the beard primary general via option a option b or option c now if you already have a teacher's training um, diploma, teacher's diploma say from current teacher's training college or or, or, or some other accredited institution you we will assess you and if it is a, a qualification that we recognize and we accept um, here we will admit you into option a of the beard primary general and in that case you will complete the program in two years if however you have normal ue's matriculation requirements which are your five CSEC subjects, including mathematics, English language, and the science subject, and two A-level subjects or equivalent, we will admit you into option B. Now we admit also into option C for those um, candidates who um, may not have UE's matriculation requirements, but have other kinds of qualifications. And so what we do, it's also a three-year program in that case, as in option B. And in that case, in option C, we assess you on a case-by-case -case basis. We look at what your qualifications are. So it might be you do not have UE's matriculation requirements, but you have done a number of other professional training courses, you have done programs, you have done certificates, and, and so on. So we act assess you on a case-by-case -case basis and we, uh, we de decide whether or not we will accept what you have um, to admit you into option C. As I said before, this year we are not um, running the BEAD ECCE program, but again, in, for that admission into that program, we usually look at UE's matriculation requirements for the program. So the modes of delivery, um, as you may know, and um, I mean, everyone must know that we are in pandemic mode and um, it has forced educational institutions to respond in creative and innovative ways. Now here at the School of Education, we have been delivering, and as Dr. Majid alluded to earlier, we have been delivering our courses in the blended modality for the past five years, maybe even more, but I recall five, five, five you know, years back. Now, we are therefore very comfortable in the online delivery environment. We have been doing it. This year, however, is very historic, as we all know, and groundbreaking. And the pandemic has pushed every one of us further. And so what we are doing here at the School of Education, we are leaping forward from our comfort zone with the blended and we are moving into the completely online delivery for all of our courses. So when you would have applied into this program for admission into this program, we may not have known this at the time. So it may have been advertised as a blended program, meaning some face-to-face -face and some online. So that's where we are. We are, we are in the blended mode. That's where we were actually when you applied in the blended mode where we, we would have offered the program in the blended modality, some face-to-face -face sessions and some online sessions. 
we are however moving into completely online and what that was that what does that mean well it means that all our lectures our tutorials all of the group meetings you will have the group presentations and everything that you'll be doing in the teaching learning environment would be done online remotely virtually and so to facilitate that we have some platforms that we use uh, lecturers, you, you know, students, even um, the administrative staff like Ms. Blake and so on, will be using these platforms to communicate with you. Lecturers will be using it to teach, to get you to interact, to have discussions and, and so on. We have Blackboard Collaborate. So you learn about this as, as you get into the, in, into the program. Um, we have Zoom, a lot of you would know about Zoom. We have Google Classrooms and we have some other online platforms. And lecturers will usually take the lead in this and guiding you um, how to go about, you know, getting on and participating via these online platforms. Now, um, I think Dr. Majid also spoke about these last two points here, that assignments are to be uploaded on the My eLearning platform. So that's a UWI platform for uploading assignments. For, um, and we as lecturers also upload, upload resource materials, um, as, tasks, assignment tasks, and so on. And when you complete your assignments, those are to be uploaded onto My eLearning as well. So again, this is something that your lecturers will hold your hand um, with as, they, you, as you navigate the, 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 the learning curve um, about my e-learning. So just to note that your assignments are not going to be handed in. They're not going to be, you know, these hard copy folders and, and these hard copy documents that you bring in, but they are to be uploaded onto the my e-learning platform. And Dr. Majid again spoke about your access. You must have um, access. You must have a computer or some device um, to participate. And yes, we want you to have reliable internet access and Wi-Fi connectivity so that you can participate meaningfully in the online environment. So uh, things to bear in mind in the completely in, in the completely online environment, however, um, it's new to all of us. And sometimes we, we do things, we, we tend to do things out of habit and because we are accustomed to. So when you are functioning in the online environment, it is important to remember, well, netiquette. So you want to Remember, if you have a question to ask, or you would like to make a comment, or you'd like to contribute to some discussion, there is the raise hand. You have it, it's called raise hand in Zoom. I'm not sure what it's called in some other platforms, but there is that facility where you kind of indicate that you want to make a contribution or answer, and you wait until you are, you are you know, given the okay to you make your contribution. In any online environment that you're functioning, you want to be respectful, respectful to your colleagues, respectful to your lecturers, your tutors, your coordinators. You want to be respectful even to the administrative staff because they are very helpful. Those are people you want to know, you want to, you want to be very close to, you want to make them your friends. So you need to be respectful to them as well. You need to listen. So, I mean, we are in an online environment right now. You're, you're in this online engagement here with me, and I'm just hoping people are listening so that they know what are some of the things they need to pay attention to. And you mute your microphones if you are not speaking, um, and you can turn off your cameras as well. So if you need to speak, you turn on your microphone. Once you're done, you turn your microphones off. Now, just like in the face-to-face, um, in the face-to-face -face environment, punctuality is very important in the online environment as well. Now, it is very easy to sit at home or in your room and say, well, no one knows if I'm here or I'm not here, and I could probably just come in a little bit late or leave a little bit early or whatever it is. Yes, you can do all of that, and you can do that in the face-to-face -face environment as well, but we do have systems in place. Most, most of the online platforms have that feature where you can tell whether participants are here or they are not. 
So we want you to take punctuality just as seriously as you would in the face-to-face -face environment. We want you to be there, attend our classes. Dr. Skerritt spoke about this. Dr. Majid spoke about this. Be there, attend your classes. That is the only way you will know what is going on and be able to do what you have to do. Again, just as in the face-to-face -face environment, you need to pull your weight. A lot of the things that you'd be doing would involve group work and you depending on your colleagues and you have to remember, you have to know, you have to want, you have to make sure that you pull your weight because if you don't, you have to work as a team. Dr. Majid spoke about this. You need to work as a team. You need to work as a team. Be a team player. Pull your weight. Do your part. Make your contribution to the group task, to the group presentation, to the group work, whatever it is just as you would in the face-to-face -face setting. We do have the chat forum in Zoom like we do now this morning where we are encouraging you if you have questions or comments or require clarification, you can type your questions in the chat forum. Most of the online platforms that you'll be interacting through for the semester or for the year or for the three years, whatever it is, will have that feature and you are encouraged to use that forum if you are in a class or you're in a tutorial session or whatever it is, and you wish to ask, uh, ask a question or make a comment, you can use that forum. Attend, participate, contribute, and complete your assignments. Those are very important. We want you to attend, we want you to participate, we want you to come to contribute, and of course, we want you to complete your assignments. Upload your assignments in a timely manner. So because you're uploading your assignments, you, a lot of the, my learning will have a particular time, a cutoff, a deadline. So you, let's say your assignment is due on the 15th of September, 2020. Um, there's usually a cutoff time, like, you know, 12 midnight on the 15th of September, 2020, and you are to upload your assignment by that time. If you run late, if it's later than that and you have not uploaded your assignment, then you will not be able to upload your assignment. So it is different from the face-to-face -face environment a little bit in that way. Because if your assignment is due at four o'clock on, on Friday evening and you get into the office 10 past four, you know, Miss Blake or whom I, or Miss Dano might say, okay, I'll take it, but not so in the online environment. So you need to know when the deadline for uploading your assignment is, and you need to make sure that you get onto your computer, have your internet access, and upload your assignments in a timely manner. Do not wait until two minutes before the deadline to try to upload. That may not work in your favor. And also, in that same vein, it is very important to have a backup plan. Electricity can go at any time. Wi-Fi can go down at any time. Computers can crash. So one, do not wait until the last minute to try to upload your assignment. And the two, have a backup plan. Have an aunt whom you can probably go by, you know, an hour before the assignment is due just in case, or some kind of backup plan. Make sure you have a backup plan to upload your assignment. Whether it is in-class activities, in-class tasks, whatever it is, try to always have a backup plan because we are not operating in the normal way or in the way that we are accustomed to. Remember too, that we are all here to help you and to support you. So do not hesitate to contact us and do contact us by email. That having been said, we want to strictly enforce this bit here that is written in red and bold and underlined. Please use your official UWE email address when communicating with us. Who are the us here? Dr. Majid, Dr. Skerritt, all of your lecturers, Miss Blake, Miss Danu, all of your lecturers, the librarian, Miss Blake, Miss Da, I'm repeating it myself, recording all of us. Please use your official UE email address when you are sending us an email and communicating with us or asking a question or would like clarification, whatever it is. Okay, Let's see. And extremely important, we want you to check your official, that same UE email that you would have. That's how we will communicate to you. That is how we will send information to you. 
So you need to check your UV email every day, maybe multiple times per day for information, updates, changes, links, etc. Please check your email every day. Remember that we are functioning in a remote environment, so all information will be relayed to you via email and other online media as your lecturers and tutors and so will advise. Um, so, getting down into the nitty gritty, what is the structure of the B.Ed. program? Well, um, the B.Ed. primary program targets both trained and untrained teachers. And we, when we say trained here, we are talking about those who would come in under option A, and so would probably have some prior training like would have completed a teacher's training diploma or, or some sort, right? Something like that. Um, so it targets the trained people, trained candidates who would enter into option A, as well as untrained teachers, meaning persons who have not had prior professional training. All right. Now, we, we want you to be attached to school ideally. Um, because a lot of the courses that you will be doing will have tasks and assignments and so on that would require you to do in-class activities. Now, we know that we will not have physical classes. We are operating in a pandemic. We know that you will not physically be in front of a group of students teaching. In fact, a lot of the teaching that will happen in this upcoming semester for certain and maybe even beyond would be online kinds of interaction, online kinds of teaching. But in any event, we would like you to, if you, if you are attached to a school, fine. It means that if you are teaching your students using the online, in the online environment, you'd be able to complete those tasks. You might be able to send, you know, whatever it is to your students or be able to interact with them in some way to complete the tasks that we would want you to do in the courses. But if you are not attached to a school, what we would like, and you should have provided this to us already, is a written um, permission, authorization, some kind of evidence to us to indicate that you are not attached to a school, but that you do have access to a school for the duration of the program. So some persons may have done this already. Uh, I'm thinking maybe all. And um, it means, therefore, that you are telling us that you are not attached to a school, but you have access to a school in the event that we require you to, you know, interact with students and get some um, activities completed through um, teacher-student interaction in a school setting. So I've said this before, the trained persons, those with teacher's diploma or equivalent, these persons will enter into option A. And the untrained persons, those without a teacher's diploma or equivalent, would um, enter into option B or C. Um, now, we have uh, the B.Ed., as I said, is a three-year program. Um, we have courses um, each semester. So you have B.Ed. courses. But in addition, and those you would get, you, you, when you get into academic advising later this evening, we'll go through that. Um, but in addition to your B.Ed. courses, you also have to complete three foundation courses in order to graduate. So every student must complete three foundation courses in addition to all of the B.Ed. courses. I think there are 24 B.Ed. courses that you would complete over the duration of the three-year period. So you're doing those 24 courses over the three-year period, but in addition to that, three foundation courses. And of the three, you must do, everybody must do um, foundations 1101, Caribbean Civilization, foundations 1210, Science, Medicine, and Technology. And persons who um, come in with... Um, Communication studies would have done CAPE and completed communication studies would have passed, ha secured a pass in communication studies. We'll be doing found 1106, academic English for research purposes. Those of you who are in um, and may not have um, a passing grade in communication studies would not have completed communication studies, will have to be do found 1001, English for academic purposes. 
Now I'll talk a little bit more about the English for academic purposes on the next slide. But all of these foundation courses have been timetabled into the program. So you don't have to worry. They are on your timetable and you will know when you can, which, which semesters they are being offered and so you can register for them. So going back to the found 1001, right? The English for academic purposes. You can only register. So it's on the timetable, it's in the semester, and you can only register for the found 1001 if you have a grade one in CSEC English language. So if you don't have communication studies, so you have to do found 1001, but you have a grade one in CSEC English language, you can register for it. If you do not have a grade one in English language, then you must go and register for ELPT. Dr. Majid spoke a little bit about it, English language proficiency test, which we offer here on campus. And we will talk a little bit about that again in academic advising. You must register for ELPT. You must pass ELPT. And once you have secured a pass in ELPT, you can register for found 1001. Now you need to check your notice boards. So if you don't have the, the, the grade one in English language and you have to do ELPT, you need to know when it's being offered. So it is offered three times a year. Um, you need to check your notice boards. Well, we don't have physical notice boards, but we will be communicating this to you um, on our Blackboard Collaborate notice board, perhaps, or whatever, or via email, your UE email. So you need to know when it is offered and you need to register for it. So it is offered three times a year, mid-August, mid-October, and mid-February. That's the ELPT. So if you register for it, let's say, in, let's say you have to do it and you register for it in mid-October, by the end of semester one, you'd, have a, you'd know whether or not you've passed. And if you've passed it, then you can register for FAUN 1001 the next semester because FAUN 1001 is offered every semester. All right. The B Ed Primary. So some of this, um, I think um, we would have met when Dr. Majid um, did her presentation. Um, let's see, the degree, the B Ed Primary General degree is awarded based on accumulation of 93 credits over a three year period. Um, most of the courses are three credit courses. We have some six credit courses, a few of them. We have three semesters per academic year. Um, so we have the September to December, then we have the January to April and the May to August. So we have three semesters, meaning that you, you, you can do courses in all three semesters. And in fact, we have courses timetabled every semester. You are expected to register for the courses at the start of each semester. So for each semester, we have a specific number of courses. We have a fixed number of courses for you to register. For, and we will deal with this again in academic advising, which follows this evening and onward, this afternoon and onwards. But you are to register for the courses only in the semester in which they are listed. And you can't decide, well, I don't want to do this and I want to do this instead and, and that kind of thing. We have fixed courses on the B.Ed. Primary General Program every semester and you have to register for those. Again, Dr. Majid spoke about being vigilant and checking your academic transcript online. I am saying be vigilant and check your academic transcript online again. I am also saying check your UE emails regularly, email regularly. Again, Dr. Majid spoke about registration, that it is your responsibility to see that you are registered, your registration status is up to date and accurate, that you are registered for the courses you ought to be registered for, nothing less, nothing more. Assignment dates are to be treated as official examination dates. So I spoke a little bit about this already, where if you have a deadline to, by which to upload your assignment, that you must upload before that deadline. It is an official deadline. After that, you cannot submit an assignment. 75% attendance must be maintained even online. So 
In the physical setting, we would normally have you sign an attendance register and we can see whether or not you are here and how often you are here, but you must make 75% attendance in order to be able to graduate. You can complete all of your courses, pass all of your courses, do all of your foundation courses, be the best student, but if you do not attend 75% of the time, we will not graduate you. And as I said, we have a way of checking this online, so we will know if you are there, when you are there, and when you're not there as well. Now, all of the marks for the assignments are uploaded on um, Banner. It's an electronic system that manages um, marks and grades and so on. And you'd learn a little bit more about this as we go on. So we don't call you in and give you grades or put it up on the notice board um, anywhere. We upload it onto Banner. You have access to Banner once you are a red, properly registered student. You can go in and check banner and you can see whether or not you, you know, you, you passed a course or, or, or whatever. Now, note carefully. Now, this is for this afternoon and beyond for the academic advising rally. You cannot register for courses, any courses, if there are holes on your student record. So you must have these holes removed. And in order to get these holes removed, there are some things you must do. So for example, this is just an example. There are other kinds, these are just examples. All of you would have new students will have an academic advising hold. I think even continuing students will have an academic advising hold. And in order to get that hold removed, you must attend academic advising. And when you attend academic advising, we, 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 we look at the courses that you will, we, we advise you on the courses that you need to register for and so on. We tell you all the things that you need to know and you agree, then we can lift the academic advising hold and you can register. You must be financially arranged either through gate or otherwise to get the financial hold lifted. There is also a financial hold on your record and that must be lifted in order for you to be registered. And you must register only for the courses approved by your academic advisor. So after academic advising this afternoon and beyond, your academic advisor will say, okay, these are the courses that you have to register for, and they'll tell you, you know, all of the process and so on, and only at that time you can go ahead and register for your courses. Right. Now, note, these are some of the things that, you know, we tell all students and, the, you know, you as teachers will one day be telling your students this. Those of you who are already teachers are probably telling your students this and those who will become teachers will tell their students this. Um, please work hard and work smart as you progress through the program. We do not want you to la hey, that is a word I heard, you know, three times for the morning. You need to organize, buckle down, work hard, work smart. It is, a, a, Professor Delisle spoke about this in his introductory video and he said that it is an intense program. I agree with him, it is an intense program. You need to work hard, you need to work smart. Do not procrastinate. It is easy to say, well, you know, I'll do this tomorrow. Oh, well, you know, I will, I will, I will check out those resources a little bit later on. Procrastination is the thief of time. I think I heard my grandmother saying that. Do not procrastinate. Attend all of your lectures. We've said this before. Complete and upload assignments on time. We've said this before. Follow instructions and advice carefully. We've said this before. Reach out to us if you encounter challenges. Please do. And we want you all to graduate with flying colors. So we want you to work hard, work smart, and do not procrastinate. Some of this, again, I don't know, we may have met this. Um, yeah, so we have some sources of help. We have the faculty handbook, which is available online from the faculty website. We have the B.Ed. handbook, which is available from the School of Education site. You've met Miss Blake, our AA administrative assistant. She is the ABLE moderator. She is one that you want to be very friendly with. She's one that you want to know well. She's one you want to stay in close contact with. I am the coordinator of the B.Ed. Um, when we have the B.Ed. ECCE running, Dr. Majid coordinates that. Um, we have Miss Marisha Dano. She's the person who let you in from the waiting room. She is another person you want to be very, very close to. She's a very important person, a very important resource person. 
Um, we have the librarian who you're going to hear from just in a little bit. Um, and we have a very competent and, and able library staff. Um, you will not be able to access the library physically and interact with the staff physically, but we can, you can still do all of the things that you, you can do in the online environment and the librarian will talk a little bit more about that just now. Um, there is also a library orientation, which again the librarian will talk to you about. And here on campus, we have the health center, we have the disabilities unit, we have the student support services. Those are all on main campus. And Ms. Dano, uh, Ms. Blake, um, the handbook, all of those will help you to find your way around um, those resources. We have also a staff student liaison committee for every level. So for those who are in levels two and three who may be on, they know what this is. Um, level one students, new students, we will have to um, get a, a student rep for level one and we will have a staff student liaison committee rep from level one there. This is really a committee where staff and students get an opportunity to meet and to talk about any issues or challenges that students may have that we are unaware of and that students would like us to address, whether it is lack of internet connectivity, no device, um, uh, assignments, um, too, too many assignments, uh, yeah, I'm due to close, um, whatever it is, issues with your lecturers, issues with your courses, issues, whatever it is. This is the opportunity for students to tell staff what are their burning issues. And again, I want to reiterate, um, in sources of help, your UE email address is very important. This is how you communicate to us. We will respond to you this way. We will contact you this way. We want you to use your official UE email address to communicate with us. And again, um, some of this Dr. Majid spoke about, so the parking, eating, and washroom, those are all um, on-site kinds of things. So in the online environment, you won't really be um, I mean, you, you, I mean, you will want to know where those things are should you return to us here on site, and you will, but um, at this point in time, um, what is important um, will be your ID cards. So you need to get your ID cards. Dr. Majid spoke a little bit about that. Your devices and connectivity challenges, we want you to tell us about that. Let us know so if we can extend any help, we can so do. Computer literate, you need to be computer literate for your assignments, to register, all of that. And I think that was in our ad as well. Plagiarism, Dr. Majid spoke about that. Grade point average, Dr. Majid spoke about that. And um, assignment deadline dates, we spoke about that as well. So that's it. Um, let me stop sharing. And um, so that's my presentation. Um, it's an overview of the B.Ed. Uh, Primary General. And as I said, you have important persons you can contact, stay in touch with us, let us know, and um, we will try to be as helpful as we can. So I'll now thank you and I'll hand over to Ms. Blake to continue on. Ms. Blake. Hi, thank you, Dr. Sharma, for that very detailed explanation and, uh, and the information that students need to pay attention to as they engage on this journey with us at the School of Education. At this time, I would like to introduce one of our current students who is a student representative, Ms. Nikisha Sarayas, to address the audience and give them a little bit about her experience as a student here and things that they should note and they, as they embark on this journey with us. Ms. Sarayas? Good morning to the BI coordinator, Dr. Moral Sharma, ECC program coordinator, Dr. Abdul Majid, SOE librarian, Dr. Renwick, lecturer, Dr. Paulson Skerritt, program secretary, Ms. Dano, moderator, Ms. Blake, and to you, my fellow students, both new and continuing. So the first thing I'd like to say in my reflections on UE life is this. Everyone's UE experience is gonna be different it's gonna be totally different because we all have different circumstances, different responsibilities, different family matters, different individual problems. So uh, even though we're doing the same program, our experience of that program is going to be different. All right, um, the first topic that I'm gonna touch on today is the notorious time management. 
yeah, whether you just came out of secondary school or you're in the work environment, time management is something that we hear a lot of. And it's no different here in UE. Now, I'm not going to lie and say, yo, I'm the time management queen. I am definitely not. But it helps to schedule. Scheduling is so important. When you get your timetable, some persons print it out. Some persons, you know, draw it up, design it. Make sure and have your timetable everywhere. When I came into UE, I printed out mine. I had one on my door, one, a copy on my phone, some in my notebooks. Timetables are so, so, so important because you're now coming into this space. You might be a little bit flustered. Like, for example, myself, when I came into UE, I didn't have uh, much friends. All my friends went into the main campus. I didn't have anyone in this program doing it with me. So I was, I was so nervous for everything. I wanted to get everything right and these sort of things. And you know, you mess up. Let's be real, you mess up. Some of you, this is the first time heading into tertiary education. You're gonna be flustered. It is so different from secondary school. You're gonna mess up, but scheduling helps. Also, another key factor is communication. Like myself, I didn't have anybody, and some of you may be the same way. You may not know what is going on. You may not have anyone to explain UE life to you, tertiary education to you. This is where communication is important. Communication with both your students, your peers in your classroom, as well as the lecturers. So let me touch on students first. Communication with your students is important because here is why. You could be the king or the queen at programming yourself, scheduling everything, you're on the ball. And then one day, one assignment, one draft that has to be submitted, one presentation and you drop the ball. You either you're hit with responsibilities, you forget you had um, this thing due, that thing due. It happens. It really does happen. You could be at the top of your game and boom, things happen. You drop to the bottom of the ladder. But this is where your peers come in. This is where communicating with your peers come in. I would suggest, um, well, when the student reps are um, decided, create a group chat. Yeah, you know, people are going to say, yeah, oh gosh, too much group chat, too much messages. Yeah, yeah. With group chats, there's a lot of messages and whatnot. But these group chats have saved me so many times. When I think the assignment is due on the fourth, it's due on the first. And I, in my head, it's due on the fourth. And then somebody just sent a little message. Oh, God, I'm struggling with this thing. Can't believe this thing due on the first. And i like, due on the first? Due on the first? When this thing due on the fourth? It happens. It really does happen. And now that we're at home, with the current pandemic that's happening, everybody is at home, you know, you have more responsibilities coming at you. So you may get a little flustered sometimes, but communicating with your peers is so, so, so important. Not just for assignments and whatnot, but just understanding content. Sometimes a lecturer um, may explain something in a way that you may not understand, right? Or even like, for example, myself, I have a toddler at home. So when I'm doing online classes, he may just shoot a loud outburst or something like that. And I may miss something important that the lecturer said. I could hit up a friend, hey, uh, what did he or she just say? These things are very, very, very important, especially as we are totally online now. Now that's students, your peers. Now let's head to the lecturers. The lecturers provide feedback. Feedback is what you need to produce a good assignment. It is so important because here's why. You may be telling yourself in your mind, in your friend's mind, A plus B equals C. That's what you're telling yourself. You went through the lecture notes, you went through the videos, you went through all the PowerPoint presentations, everything. You think you have this assignment to the T. Then, hey, you submit a draft or whatnot, and then the lecturer send back feedback, and the feedback is A plus B equals Z. You completely negated this particular lecture note or this particular PowerPoint that has this set of information. That is why feedback is so important. So that's why it is very, very, very important to keep an email communication with your lecturer so that you can get feedback on assignments and whatnot. And the last thing I have to say is something a bit cliche, but it's very important as well. Enjoy what you do. So, so, so important because here's what. It's not gonna be an easy road going to be very straight with you. It's not going to be an easy road at all, at all, at all. You're going to be hit with some bricks. 
it's gonna be frustrating at times. You're gonna wanna drop out. You're gonna say, oh gosh, I can't handle this thing. It's too much family, this personal life, individual struggles. You're gonna get frustrated. But at that, that passion you have to, whatever the reason may be for you wanting to complete this degree, whether you wanna work with children, whether you wanna do this, you wanna open up this, whatever it may be, we all have our individual passions inside of us. But that passion is what is gonna drive you to work out your struggles, to go through this difficult assignment, to go through these frustrating times, it's gonna drive you so that's why enjoying what you do is so 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 important so that's just my little two cents on uv life and just keep focus keep your head up and just enjoy it enjoy it even though we're going through a little um chaotic time right now in the world just enjoy what you do watch videos do your readings um watch your powerpoint re um look over your classes and whatnot so 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 important and make sure and communicate with your peers from your class so that's all i have to say thank you miss blake and i hope you guys have a wonderful time at uv okay, thank you very much miss sorias and that was very in, insp inspiring reminding us that we need to schedule communicate and enjoy and at this time in order to help us obtain our, our resources online, we're going to introduce Dr. Shaman Rennick, our School of Education's librarian. Dr. Rennick? Okay, thank you, Ms. Blake. Um, good morning, students. Welcome to the School of Education and welcome to the School of Education Library. It is my task to introduce you to the facilities, the resources, and the services. So first, I'm going to show a video tour of the library, and then I will do a short presentation. Allow me to share my screen, please. Upon entering the School of Education Library, you will be greeted by our in-house security officer who is responsible for the safety of library staff and users and for ensuring that the following conduct is observed within the library. The university requires that students display ID cards at all times. Additionally, a current UE ID is required to access the library's print and electronic resources. The following are not permitted in the library. Bags, umbrellas, food or drink, children, cell phone use. Mobile phones should be turned off or placed on silent mode. All calls must be taken outside. Should the book alarm go off on passing through the security gates, the security officer is authorized to send persons back to the circulation desk to have the items properly checked out. The library offers a locker service for students' use. These lockers can be rented daily at a cost of $2 per four-hour session on a first-come, first-serve basis. A limited number of lockers are also available at a cost of $60 per semester. Keys are available at the circulation desk. The online public access catalog or OPAC is utilized for checking the availability of material in all of the university's campus libraries. There are three dedicated OPAC stations and you are encouraged to use them to determine the availability and location of materials that might be relevant to your research needs. You may also access the OPAC via the library's website from off-campus locations including your home, workplace and mobile devices. The OPAC provides you with a call number that will assist you in locating the item in the library's collections. Behind the circulation desk are the library's Reserve, West Indiana, and student papers collections. Reserve items are books recommended or required by lecturers for specific courses. They are normally loaned for three hours if there is only one copy 
or for three days if there are multiple copies of the item. The student paper's collection consists of deferred dissertations and curriculum studies from previous students who received an A grade. The collection also contains MED research projects. Student papers may only be used in the library and may not be photocopied. You can find a list of the student papers on the School of Education Library's website under the Research tab. Fines for the late return of materials from the Reserve, West Indiana and the student paper collections are $1 per hour during the library's business hours. If you are looking for an item but it is already on loan, you can make a request for it to be placed on hold for you at the circulation desk. You will be notified when the item is available for your use. You may also check at the circulation desk. Two black and white and one color or print copy machines are available in the library. They are self-service machines operated using your smart ID cards. The cost of printing and copying is 25 cents per page for black and white and $4 per page for color. Library staff will help you set up your copy or print account on your smart ID cards the first time you need to use the machine. You may then add money to your account as needed. Finally, the library has a study room set aside for postgraduate students only. Patrons are advised that the previously mentioned rules that govern the use of the general library area are also applicable in the postgraduate room. So the orientation um, at the SOE library, I'm Dr. Shannon Rennick, your librarian. We have a staff of eight persons to assist you. And the contents of my session today, um, I'm going to talk about the facilities, the resources, the services, the staff, and why use the library. So our library facilities, as you just saw in the video tour, um, are located on the ground floor of the new building at the School of Education on Agostini Street. But now, because of COVID, the physical library is closed. However, you can still access all of the library's online resources and services. And I'm going to speak to those. At the School of Education Library, we have education-related resources. We have over 25,000 books. We have a number of journals, we have electronic journals, and we have two special collections, which you heard about in the tour just now, the DPED projects and the curriculum studies. However, at the Alma Jordan Library on the main campus, there are multidisciplinary resources. And from this slide, you can see there's a lot of material that is also available to you. There's a substantial West Indian collection for local research. So if you have to research Caribbean um, projects, Caribbean things, the West Indiana collection is one of the places you can check. You can borrow items at the Alma Jordan Library and returns item, return items there. They have extended hours. They go to 10 at night when the library is open and there's a 24 seven computer lab and reading room. The Alma Jordan Library is going to have virtual orientation sessions from the 14th to the 18th of September. It's part of your Huey Life program, so I encourage you to attend those as well. At the SOE, um, at this time, you're going to get your um, services via the School of Education Library website. And this is what the interface looks like. So we have some notes about COVID. We have research assistants, we have an Ask a Librarian service, we have a quick guide to library services and resources. We have information, um, some FAQs that will help guide you as to what is available during this pandemic period. There is a UE library search, so here you can search across 
the resources of all four campuses and all of the subscribed resources that UE purchases. You have access to past papers and you can search the website as well. There's a brief welcome message. But on the upper right hand corner, this menu is where you're going to access the services, the Caribbean resources. You're going to discover all of the resources of the library and there's some information about the library, how to contact us. So I urge you to have a look at the School of Education Library first opportunity. We also have a portal called UE Link, and this portal is going to allow you to search across all of the UE collections. You can search by subject and you can search course reserves only. But this UE Link portal gives you access to quite a number of the resources. Um, there will be sessions where we will go through how to search this interface, how to find databases, find the journals, find the books. When you sign in, you have access, more access to full text than if you didn't sign in. We also have an institutional repository called UE Space, and here the School of Education section on this UE Space, you can find a number of resources, um, things relating to academic research, all of the handbooks, the faculty pages, and the student research. Accessing the library's online resources can be done both on and off campus. You need to have your UE ID number and a password to log in, and it is the same UE um, username and password for my.ue.edu my and my learning, the UE portal. This will provide you access to indexes and databases. So you get citations, abstracts, and you will get full text. Full text is not always available if there's something you really must have do contact the library. You will have access to e-journals, e-books, e-documents, and of course, what everyone, every student is interested in, past examination papers. If you have problem connecting to these resources or to the library, you send a message to service desk at sta.ue.edu, that is our campus IT services, and they will be able to assist you. So the in library services, which at this time you cannot access, but hopefully um, this semester is offline. If everything goes all right, maybe next semester you'll be able to come into the library. We lend books, we allow journals and the special collections to be used in-house only. We have printing facilities, photocopying, ring binding, and there is a computer lab that you can have, you have access to while you're here on campus. We have made a proposal to the director of the School of Education to allow us to do what we call a curbside pickup service for loan of books. Hopefully from September, if he gives us approval, you will be able to request the book by email or call the library. You will come to the library to pick it up and return the items to the library. If approved, we will share the details on how you can do this. So what other assistance can you get at the School of Education Library? We will help you in finding relevant authoritative quality information, both library resources and open access information. This is very important at this time where everyone thinks Google can provide you with what you need. Google is fine for personal research, but you're now in an academic institution and your work is of an academic nature and therefore, the library is here to help you find the relevant and authoritative information that you need. We will do teaching of information literacy. We will help you to understand your information environment. We will train you in searching skills and strategies to help you find information on your own. We will help you in doing in-text citations and references in what we call APA style. APA is a style produced by the American Psychological Association. And as mentioned by both of the lecturers previously, plagiarism is a problem and we will help you to avoid plagiarism by learning how to cite information correctly, by doing your references correctly. 
We will help you with formatting papers and theses using the APA style. In terms of library staff, as I mentioned, there are eight of us in the library. When you communicate with us at this time, please use your UB email address as mentioned by the lecturers before me. You can send your questions to our Ask a Librarian service. Uh, it's on the School of Ed website, or you can simply send an email to the soe.library at sta.ub.edu. We will answer any of the questions or all of the questions that you ask us and assist you with the services. So again, we have the School of Education Library website. We are, we are also on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and we do have a YouTube channel. So you can find us in a number of places and we will try to keep you up to date with activities and events at the library. Even though it's all online, we will try to do this. Um, research on library use. Why use the library? First year students who use the library had higher grade point averages and based on the research undergrads with a GPA higher than 3.1 use the library more than those with a GPA less than 3.1. So why should you use library resources? To learn what I call university style or to become an academic, to complete your assignments in a timely and successful manner, to get higher grades and therefore higher GPAs, to graduate with distinction, to be information literate in the workplace, and to be better at your job after graduation. Thank you. Please email Ask a Librarian or soe.library. This is our extension. I am Shannon Rennick and you can, you have my email address there. As they said, the orientation slides are going to be up. You can look me up, write to me personally. I'd be happy to help. Thank you. We would, at this point in time, I would like to ask the program secretary, Ms. Marisha Danu, to come and to give us some closing remarks in preparation for our session that begins at one o'clock with academic advising. Marisha? Good afternoon, everyone, and again, welcome to you, the new students. We are getting ready to close off this session, and academic advising will be starting at 1.30 with Dr. Marad Sharma. This is a session for the new students. I noted that we have some returning students who joined the session. Thank you all for joining. Um, but the new session, the new students are scheduled to come on from 1.30 this afternoon. So we are closing off at this point. We want to wish you all all the best. Thank you for joining School of Ed. I hope that you would have enjoyed all the information and you will get it again when the recording becomes live on the faculty website page. So... Thanks again for everything. Thanks again for joining UWE and more information will be given to you later on. This afternoon you will be getting information as to the courses that you would be doing. Um, of course you would have taken note you must register and teaching is scheduled to start on the 7th. The BED email is in the chat, and I think some of you may have sent some information to it before, so I will try to check it and respond accordingly. You could also send your questions there. So we, as I said, we are getting ready to close off for lunch, and one by one, you all will get advising this evening. We have advising for the rest of the week for all of you new students. So you have time, right? You have time. If you don't get through this evening, you will get through during the rest of the week. So take care, all the best. And I hope that you will enjoy your journey, your, this new program, um, your, this new journey in your life at School of Ed. So take care. Marisha, can you remind me? Uh, Marisha, can you remind students where to get the um, the link for advising? We are students. You would need to go back on the faculty's website, look out for information for academic advising for registration. Right? So go back on the Faculty of Humanities and Education page 
as you go to the page, you will see the information there. You would need to access the advising forms. And if you don't get them, they will be sent to you. So more information at 1.30. Ms. Blake, it's back to you. Thank you, Marisha. At this point in time, I would encourage three persons to log off and then follow the links that you will, that on the faculty page to re-enter for academic advising. The same procedure would be required. Once you have been accepted at the university, you need to rename yourself indicating your name, UEID, and the program that you're reading so that you can be given the relevant academic advice. Also, we'd like you to send your email of your offer letters to the VA email that was sent to you in the chat indicating queries or questions, veg at sca.uwi.edu. Okay, thank you very much. And we see you all at one o'clock, 1.30. All right, be safe, have a good lunch, and we see you at advising session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.